Welcome to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. Good morning. We are going to read Joshua chapter 18. And before we do that, let's re navigate where we're up to. So, the whole of Israel have congregated at Shiloh. And so they're going to set up the tabernacle of meeting there. Before them, the land is subdued. But there's one, well, actually there are seven tribes who have not yet taken their inheritance from God. So Joshua is prodding them and asking them, why are you waiting? Why are you neglecting? The promise is there. Why aren't you taking it? So let's dive in and read Joshua chapter 18, starting from verse 1. The whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The country was brought under their control, but there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, have given you? Appoint three men from each tribe. I will send them out to make a survey of the land and to write a description of it, according to the inheritance of each. Then they will return to me. You are to divide the land into seven parts. Judah is to remain in its territory on the south and the tribes of Joseph in the territory on the north. After you have written descriptions of the seven parts of the land, bring them here to me and I will cast lots for you in the presence of the Lord our God. The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you because the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad, Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh have already received their inheritance on the east side of Jordan. Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it to them. As the men started on their way to map out the land, Joshua instructed them, go and make a survey of the land and write a description of it. Then return to me and I will cast lots for you here at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. So the men left and went through the land. They wrote its description on a scroll, town by town, in seven parts, and returned to Josh Joshua in the camp at Shiloh. Joshua then cast lots for them in Shiloh in the presence of the Lord, and there he had distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. Good morning, friends. Thanks, Bronwyn, for reading that. Our, um, our section today follows a much bigger chunk than just chapter 18. Uh, we're looking at seven chapters that kind of span from verse 13 all the way to the end of um, chapter 19. And so we've got seven chapters, and um, if you're familiar with Joshua or just look, turn a page forward and back, you might see that there's big long lists of names and geography and all sorts of different um, hills and valleys and foothills all listed. So it's some really exciting stuff we're going to look through. Um, but let me just preface what uh, we're saying today uh, by letting you know that uh, the one thing, if you remember nothing else, the one thing to remember from this morning is that God keeps his promises. God makes promises and he keeps them. Uh, and that's that's the one big idea. If you fall asleep from now, then that's what's up, but still stay awake. I'll pray that God might help us. Heavenly Father, uh, we give you thanks that we have uh, your scripture, your words breathed here for us to learn from. Lord, we just ask for your blessing this morning. We ask that you might teach us, that you might grow us, that you might encourage us. And Lord, so we just ask that you might give us uh, ears to hear. Amen. So I did say we're looking at this uh, big section in the middle. Um, Joshua he has four kind of key movements that we've already been looking through. First, uh, sorry, chapters one to five, you know, they've uh, entered across the Jordan into the land. We see then chapters six to 12, they go around conquering the different parts of the land. And then here, 13, really through to the end of 22, they divide up the land amongst the different tribes 
before the last section, uh, Joshua gives some concluding uh, remarks, uh, some sort of departing encouragements, uh, you know, a few goodbye sermons. So that's where we're going. I've got the power. Is this, is this clicker going to work? Yeah, okay. So that's where we're going. Uh, let me first take us on a bit of a journey through the street directory that is uh, the book of Joshua at times. I, um, I have one of these. Anyone know what this is? Has anyone used one recently? Oh, some of us, some of us are still... Um, I'm, I'm dreading the evening service when everyone looks at me blankly and says, what is that book you hold? Uh, but this, uh, this is a useful tool at times. Last, uh, last week I began the gathering in the evening church by making jokes about how Ken has a poor sense of direction. Ironically, I needed to borrow his street directory then. But you may, you may recall there's this little white section at the front, then that white section is a big long list of places. It's a big long list and it says oh, what, where you find what parts of the map, where Castle Hill is, where Bass Hill is, we've got Yaguna, we've got East Hills, and it actually serves, although there's no maps, to be helpful, helpful in, in placing where different things are. These seven chapters we have this morning are like these white pages off the street directory. They take us through this journey of uh, the names of hills and valleys and troughs and cities and regions as God's people receive the different parts of the land. And so let me just jump through the different uh, tribes of Israel. Oh, the map's a bit small. But this map was borrowed from our uh, Promise to Fulfillment um, School of Ministry subject. So if you want to see the map up close, sign up because that's where you'll, you'll get it again. But... Uh, if we start at uh, chapter 13, the tribe of Reuben receives their part of the land, verse 15. Verse 24, chapter 13, the tribe of Gad receive their portion. 13.29, the eastern half of the tribe of Manasseh receive their portion. Chapter 15, verse 1, the tribe of Judah receives their portion. 16 verse 5, the tribe of Ephraim received their portion. 17 1, the western half of Manasseh received their portion. 18 11, the tribe of Benjamin received their portion. 19 1, the tribe of Simeon received their portion. 19 verse 10, Zebulun received their portion. Um, we're still going. 19 verse 17, Issachar received their portion. 19 verse 24, Asher received their portion. 1932, Naphtali received their portion. And 19 verse 40, the tribe of Dan received their portion. And that's our seven chapters. And if you've got really sharp eyes, you might be able to make out where some of these regions are. And so that's how Israel looked at the end of chapter 19. In this section of Joshua, this is where the people of God are placed. Now, it can be sometimes awkward to read through these parts of the Bible and wonder what profound truths of God we learn in the same way that reading through these white pages of the street directory might just be a little dry. But there are some profound lessons we can learn about God uh, from this section. You may have noticed that we've called this series promise and purpose. Have you seen this image floating around and thought, ah, promise and purpose, and and wondered a little bit about why those are the two words we've chosen? Well, I'm glad you asked, because today all will be revealed. You see, the first thing I want to look at is the promises of God fulfilled in this section and what we learn from that, and then secondly, the purpose that is still here for God's people as they receive the inheritance. They don't receive what God has promised and then kick off their boots, sit there with a pina colada and sip away. But there's still a purpose for God's people. So that's where we're going. The first thing we learn as we see God's people receive the promises is that God is faithful. That's the first lesson. This section is bookended um, in chapter 13 and in chapter 21 with uh, reminders that God is faithful. So that God's people, as they see all this unfold and they receive what's promised, they're remembering God's faithfulness 
Verse uh, 6 of chapter 13 says, Be sure to allocate uh, this land to Israel for an inheritance as I have instructed you. God speaking to Joshua. And divide it as an inheritance among the nine tribes and the half tribes of Manasseh because the other tribes have already received that eastern um, portion. As this section kicks off in chapter 13, Joshua's old now. And there's still some portions left, as Bronwyn's already mentioned. But what we see is God giving what he's promised. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. You know, even at this point, Joshua's old. Chapter 13 starts with that. And when God, the creator of the universe who lives eternally, says to you, man, you're old. (laughs) Like, Joshua's probably pretty old at this point. And, you know, the word old, I I couldn't help but giggle. Um, It actually describes in other parts where this word is used really, really long pointy beards. So like proper old man vibes for Joshua. He's old, but this strong military leader in his old age, this isn't going to be a hurdle for God fulfilling his promises. God is faithful. He says, I'll do the fighting. I'll make sure it all works out. So God's faithful. I uh, had a teacher, a maths teacher in high school who um, taught maths full-time, but uh, on the side, he worked uh, in the Army Reserve. And he told us uh, a story about these ginormous artillery guns that he operated uh, when they were on their you know, army training. And the projectile, when it was fired from these artillery guns, would take a significant amount of time as it flew to the target kilometres away. And, you know, they're on a a shooting range, and just as they fired the gun at that target, kilometres away, and the projectile was mid-air, a few kangaroos just jumped across the target. And sadly, the kangaroos were no more. Because once the projectile had left the gun, there wasn't anything they could do to stop it. That's what I, I think when I think of the promises of God. Once God makes a promise, once the promises of God leave his mouth, There isn't anything anyone can do to stop God's promises coming to fruition. And so what we see here is the faithfulness of God as his promises come to fruition in really genuine, tangible, practical ways. They can kick the dirt, they can pick the fruit, they can plant their crops in the land. God's faithfulness is on display. And then at the end of the section, again, we are reminded in chapter 21, verse 45, not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. And so this journey of seeing the people receive their inheritance is a reminder that God's faithful. It's also a reminder that God is generous. That's our next thing here. In the book of Joshua, the word inheritance appears 50-odd times. And if any word appears in one book of the Bible 50-odd times, and it's not like you know, a preposition or a conjunction, it's probably worth paying attention to. And just in our section this morning, we see inheritance 16, 17 times. Israel are receiving their inheritance. What is inheritance? What, what's an inheritance? Well, I think an inheritance is the realization of a promise that was made already. It's someone, it's it's you receiving something from someone else's generosity that they had promised beforehand. You can't earn or work for an inheritance. It's not something that you have deserved by your efforts, but rather it's bestowed on you from one to another. It's receiving something good at the generosity of someone else. And it's usually within the family, Because inheritance is, by nature, family business. And so we see that this repetition of inheritance reminds the people of God it's them receiving something good from their father, not because they were good or deserving, but because he is generous. And it's a a lovely, subtle reminder that they are God's people. That as they receive inheritance, it's positioning them as God's children, which is also an encouragement for them. You see, Israel, just like uh, all people throughout all of history, you and me the same, are failing and weak and undeserving of good gifts from God. But as his children, we receive an inheritance. We receive benefits at the hand of his generosity when we were undeserving. 
both for Israel as they receive land and for us as we receive uh, the inheritance that is promised in the Lord Jesus. We all receive good things at the hand of his generosity, not because we're deserving. You think of uh, Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says, and, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He didn't spare his own son. Will he not uh, graciously give us all things? As we see Israel receive their inheritance, we see that God is faithful and God is generous. But we also see that God is sovereign. That's another lesson we can learn as Israel receives uh, what was promised. Uh, in uh, what Bronwyn has read in chapter 18, we see this idea of casting lots um, for the different portions of land. It might be a bit of an odd expression for us thinking about casting lots, you know, gambling. Are we wanting people in the church to take up gambling as a way to receive land? No, I don't think that's the case here. But lots here is God's instructions to Israel. They're to do this as an expression of them trusting his control and his sovereignty over all the different moving parts. You see, he doesn't want Israel to be fighting over who Joshua unfairly gave what parts of land because who were his mates. That's not on display. But rather they cast lots time and time again as an expression of uh, leaving it to God to decide who gets what in his sovereignty. You see, as they roll the, you know, whatever the equivalent of the dice was when they were casting lots, it's not a, a, a throwing the dice to randomly decide, but it's trusting that God is the one who places the dice where it lands. It's actually trusting in God's sovereignty. We also see that God is sovereign uh, because he gives more than was actually expected. Those two and a half tribes that took that land before they crossed over the Jordan, that extra region wasn't what was originally expected by Israel. And so we see God reaching out and giving even more than his people were expecting. So that also ties into the fact that he's generous, but he's sovereign because he can reach into any part of the region. He can reach into any part of the world because God has dominion over the entire world. God can reach in and take extra land and give it to his people because he has dominion over all. All the world is his to give. He is sovereign. And so, if he wants to give Judah a, you know, oh, the map's gone, a particular, a, a big section of land to give them more cities, well, that's God's choosing. And so they just need to trust God's plan for them. But in God's sovereignty, I think there's an encouragement here and a lesson that God rules and reaches into every part of the geography, every part of the world, and every part of the lives of his people. God's sovereignty extends over the life of his people. You can't exaggerate God's control over every area of the world and life. God can expand into and speak into any area of life. There isn't a single detail or moment when God isn't in control. He's sovereign over the land and all the lives of people, his people, on display here. And so there's some of the lessons we can learn from seeing God's people receive what was promised. We see as they receive the land, as it's all divided up into the different sections and all the different hills are named, and we see that God is faithful. We see that God is generous, and we see that God is sovereign. But what about the purpose? You see, God isn't faithful and generous and sovereign and just leaves his people then to get on with uh, enjoying, um, you know, the fruits of the land while they kick back under the sun. But there is still purpose here in these chapters for God's people. And I want to think about two case studies as we consider the purpose for God's people. The first one, as we've already heard mentioned in our kids' talk, is Caleb. Caleb has great purpose interwoven with his receiving of God's promises. Chapter 14 recounts the story of Caleb's life. Uh, you may remember it. It's, it's a fairly familiar story. He goes into the city and he spies it out and him and Joshua are the only ones that trust God. The rest say, oh, everyone's too big and scary. We don't want to do that. And so at that point, that generation, all except Caleb and Joshua, then uh, are set to die in the wilderness. Uh, but Caleb and Joshua, they get to inherit 
And so here's Joshua now, 85 years old, still as vigorous for serving the Lord as day one, it says. And he's receiving that very same land, ironically, that he spied out. You see, for, for Caleb, faithfully, wholeheartedly following God is interwoven with his receiving of God's promises. The two are interwoven. I think there's a great lesson and some some take-home for us as we look at the example Caleb sets. He doesn't leave the land, hear the promise that he's going to inherit it while you know everyone else dies, and then spend 40 years just chilling, waiting for the nation, you know, you know, to pass away so he can then go back and collect. But he wholeheartedly follows God while he awaits the receiving of what God has promised. There is purposes for God's people. And the purpose for Caleb? Wholeheartedly following God. And so we who are called to be the children of God, who have a promised inheritance in the Lord Jesus that will never perish, spoil and fade, well, the lesson from Caleb isn't that we just kick back and relax while we wait, but that we continue wholeheartedly following the Lord Jesus, who has called us into this family and made these promises to us. The other, the other little lesson that I, I think worth pointing out that I love in uh, the, the section, chapter 14, where Caleb receives his land, and it parallels to when Joshua receives his land, but these two blokes, it, it's really detailed and speaks to their particular circumstance. And in the section that's seven chapters about tribes and nations and regions, the details aren't lost for the individual. So even when all this big national division is happening, With all that big picture stuff, God still sees and notices the individual. I just, I found that really encouraging that in the sea of all the different things that God could be worrying about that are happening for God's people, God notices and sees the individual. It's that same image of Jesus as that good shepherd who knows the names of his sheep. And so there's a a lesson and an encouragement. Uh, in the purpose of Joshua as he is receiving the promises. The other case study, I thought, was the Levites. Now, those of you who were listening sharply might have noticed that the Levites, they get mentioned all the time, yet they didn't get a plot of land. That just doesn't seem fair, does it? But, like uh, we saw in chapter 18, the Levites do receive an inheritance of sorts. It says in verse 7, The Levites, however, do not get a portion among you because the priestly service of the Lord is their inheritance. It echoes what uh, was foretold again in Deuteronomy 18, that the Lord himself, their service of him, would be the very inheritance for the Levites. Now, yes, they were given food to meet their needs and they were given a town to live in. We see that a bit later on in chapter 21 or 22. Um, So God still provides and meets their needs, but they don't get a plot of land they need to work and dig and sow in, but rather their job is to continue with the work of the Lord, continue with their priestly duties. And so as all the promises of God are being fulfilled, the Levites still have that task. The role hasn't finished. There is still work and purpose for God's priests. And... 1 Peter 2, we reminded that we as God's people are still all priests. And so there is still work for us as God's people to be doing while we wait for the realisation of the promises of God in the Lord Jesus for us. I think it's also uh, a subtle reminder uh, for the Israelites that there's an inheritance beyond the land. While all the Israelites are getting excited about their new patch of land and planting their crops, again, all excited about what they've waited Granted, they've been waiting like 700, 800 odd years since Genesis when the promises were made to Abraham. They've been waiting, they've travelled uh, great distances, they've you know, had a whole generation die in the desert, they've been slaves in Egypt, like it's been a long time coming. So granted, they're going to be pretty pumped to finally get their plot of land, build their house for the long term, plant their crops. But the Levites is just, I think, a subtle reminder to the people of God here that there is an inheritance beyond the physical land right here and right now, that is 
God himself. The Levites don't need to toil and occupy themselves with the things of of the land because there's a purpose for them in their serving of God. And so I think as we consider what is a somewhat of a dry read, if you were to read verses, you know, sorry, chapters 13 to, you know, 20 um, by yourself in your quiet time, it might not be energizing necessarily. But what it tells us is that God keeps his promises that he's faithful and generous and sovereign. And there's some reminders there that God's people still have purpose while they wait for the receiving of what he's promised. And so let me encourage, as I finish, uh, you and I, as God's people waiting to receive the inheritance that we have promised in the Lord Jesus, there is still work to be done. Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the resurrection of Jesus and he brings about this word inheritance as well. And what does he say? Verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. As God's people, uh, like 1 Peter tells us, uh, we're all priests. There's work to be done. There's purposes for us as God's people. We have ministry and mission to be doing. And Paul's encouragement is, knowing that there is an inheritance to come, let's stand firm, let's give ourselves fully to the work of God, knowing that our labors aren't going to be in vain. Let me finish by praying and asking uh, for God's help as we uh, seek to do that. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks that you keep your promises, that you're faithful and sovereign and generous, and that you have a purpose for us as your people. Lord, I just pray that you might um, give us energy and resolve as we seek to follow you. Lord, we just ask uh, for your blessing as we serve you. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you uh, might work through us in uh, those different ministries and missions uh, in which we serve. And Lord, we just ask for your blessing uh, as we seek to do that today, this week, this month, um, and for the many years that you may have in store for us. Lord, so we just ask for your blessing um, in the Lord Jesus. Amen. You have been listening to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, get further information, or download other resources, please visit our website at lmap.org dot au